Morning, church. Happy Sabbath. Such a beautiful day today, huh? It's cold weather, but because of the heat from the sun, it makes it uh, feel perfect. <clears throat> okay, announcement for today. Uh, church budget update. Our projected monthly uh, budget is uh, 5,900. As of December, we received so far 2,108. Uh, I encourage everyone to continue to be faithful in giving our tithes and offering to meet our budgets. Uh, prayer and best for meetings. Everyone is invited for our uh, uh, prayer and Vesper during uh, midweek and Vesper on Fridays and same time, 7.30 p.m. Today we have AY program, Adventist Youth. And please read your uh, uh, bulletin, it's all in here. Uh, Adventurer Club, 1.30 to uh, 3 p.m. Uh, Pathfinder Club, 1.30 to uh, 3 p.m. AUA High School program, uh, Christmas program is tonight at uh, 6 p.m. at Hanford SDA Church. I encourage everyone uh, to attend. It's uh, two weeks ago, or oh, last week. They have the program, hopefully the same one. It's beautiful program. Our uh, Actors and actors, they did an awesome God, uh, job, especially the singing. This is a heads up. General uh, Patlock, December 18 and 25. Bring your uh, specialties, the uh, menu that you love to share to all of us. Especially that Christmas Day, December 25th. Once again, we're going to have a padlock. Any news that I, uh, uh, announcement that I miss? Okay, to our uh, uh, visitors, we have a uh, couple of uh, visitors uh, today. This is Elmer Steinberg, Plum Clavis, is he here? Oh, welcome. <laughs> it's kind of hard to see there with the reflection of the sun. Uh, Kiana Tabura, we call her Peanut. <laughs> and uh, Bethany Tabura. Welcome. Thank you for uh, visiting us. And um, I don't have any more announcements. And we have a, there's a couple there. I don't know. I did not get their names. Please let, write it down. Say again. Okay. okay. Welcome. Okay. Welcome to our church. Before we move on to our divine service or uh, our singing,
I would like to please allow me to read from the book of uh, Peace Above the Storm, Fullness of Joy. In a view of glorious inheritance that may be his, what shall a man give in exchange of his soul? Matthew 16, 26. He may be poor, yet he possesses in himself a wealth and dignity that the world could never bestow. The soul redeemed and cleansed from sin with all its noble powers dedicated to the service of God is of surpassing worth. And there is a joy in heaven in the presence of God and the holy angels over one soul redeemed, a joy that is expressed in songs of holy triumph. Happy Sabbath to everyone. Sheep scattered around. The shepherds settled in for another quiet night, probably swapping stories as they watched the flocks. Then, in a divine moment, God burst into the night. Angels appeared, singing songs and speaking of the Savior's birth. Angels we have heard on high reminds us of this amazing night. Please join us as we sing. Angels we have heard on high Singing sweetly through the night And the mountains in the light Echoing the brave delight Gloria In a chance
Christmas is a time of spiritual reflection on the important foundations of the Christian faith. It's also a celebration. It's when Christians celebrate God's love for the world through the birth of Christ's child, Jesus. The Bible tells of his birth hundreds of years before fulfilling prophecies, and we can find that in the Bible. Father in heaven, we come into your presence with grateful hearts for the way you have blessed and sustained and provided for us through the week and how you have brought us to this place to be together in your house on your holy day to worship you. I pray that you give us receptive hearts so that the messages that come through in the songs, the stories, the prayers, the message 
will sail home to our hearts today, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Angels from the realms of glory, when your flights are all the earth, ye who sang creation story, now proclaim Messiah's birth. Come and worship, worship Christ the newborn King. Shepherds in the fields abiding, watching o'er your flocks by night. God with man is now residing, yonder shines the infant light. Come and worship, come and worship, worship Christ the newborn King. Sages live your contemplations, brighter visions beam afar. Great desire of nations, ye have seen his little star. Come and worship, come and worship, worship Christ the newborn King. Saints before the altar bending, watching on in hope and fear. shall appear. Come and worship, come and worship, worship Christ the newborn King. You may now be seated. A happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Our offering today is for community service, Adventist community service. If, this is to meditate, if your church or church disappear today, do anyone other than members uh, even notice? Our neighbors are numerally or associates and special friends. They are not simply those who belong to our church or who think as we do. Our neighbors are the whole human family. Community service is God's invitation to do amazing things with him. Hard times come in all shapes, sizes, colors. An Adventist community service is responding to individual needs, developing relationships and committing to make a difference in people's life. Adventist Community Service supports community outreach programs by funding development projects that make a major impact in your communities. For example, a washer or a dryer serves thousands of homelands to bring dignity and value to their life. A shelter provides protection and offers hope. A portable shower trailer prepares someone for a job interview, and so much more. I had just lost my son Christopher to cancer. The church could not bring back my son to me, but what they did was they brought my life back to me. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. By supporting community service, you can make a lasting impact and know that your dollars are going to, to something that is making a difference in somebody's life. May the deacons come forward.
all stand? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for giving us the best of the best, your only begotten Son. Thank you so much that we all cover uh, with his blood. At this moment, Lord, we ask for a special blessing for our little tokens, the Tyson offerings. Um, please bless them. So may the people know that you are God, that you love them, and you are coming soon. Thank you so much. Please help us to give us to give you the best of our life. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. It's time for children's story. Come forward and Mr. Steinberg will give the story. He's one of the faculty or teacher at AUA. Thank you, Mr. Stember, for doing it. Good morning, kids. How are you guys doing today? Good. That's awesome. All right. How many of you guys have ever been to camp meeting? Anybody here been to camp meeting before? All right. We've got a couple. All right. So when I was just about four, all right, I was just about to turn four, I went to camp meeting in a faraway country called South Africa. All right. And this country not exactly the safest place to be at all times. And I was at camp meeting, and I had just barely finished my children's program, and I don't understand why. It wasn't the smartest decision I've ever made, but I decided to leave the tent I was at and start walking. And right outside the tent I was at was a giant gate. And this gate took me outside onto the side of the road. And for whatever reason, I still can't understand, but I started walking. And I'm walking, and I'm walking, and I'm walking. And all of a sudden, I realize I have absolutely no clue where I am. All right, I'm on the middle of the road, well, on the side of the road. In the middle of the road is a bunch of cars flying by, nice and fast. And I don't know what I should do. Should I turn around? Should I keep going? Should I try to cross the street? I have no clue. Well, luckily for all of us, 
we have a God in heaven that cares. And my parents had taught me that whenever something bad happens or whenever something good happens, no matter what, to always pray. So right there, I got down on my knees and I prayed. And I asked for God to keep me safe and to tell me where to go. And I felt impressed to continue walking. I continue walking and continue walking and continue walking. And once again, I'm starting to get scared again. And the cars are still whizzing by, nice and fast. And I still have no clue where I am. So once again, I got down on my knees and I started praying. And I prayed the exact same prayer. And once again, I felt impressed to just continue walking. And I did. And the cars continued to whiz by. And it almost seems like it's getting busier and busier. It almost seems like I'm in the middle of a city now. And once again, I'm getting scared. So what should we do when we're scared? I got down and I prayed to God. And I prayed again. Lord, please help me to get to where I need to be safely. Keep me safe and tell me where to go. And right after I finished that prayer, I still remember this feeling like it was yesterday. I felt impressed that everything was going to be all right. That I was almost exactly where I needed to be. I continued walking for a little bit. And pretty soon, I come up to a gate that looks a lot like the one I had left however many minutes before. And right when I walk in, a family member was there waiting for me. They didn't even know I had decided to go on my own journey into not great places. So kids, I want you guys to always remember, no matter what, no matter if it's big or small, all right, if it's dangerous or safe, doesn't matter. God always cares, and no matter what, we can always pray to him, and he will always help lead us in the right direction. Amen. All right, you guys can have a seat. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Good morning, happy Sabbath. Our scripture reading this morning comes from two books in the New Testament that I'll be reading. And um, the reason for that is it's a story about the poor widow's gift. And the gospel writers, Mark and Luke, have a little slight twist to um, the story about the poor widow's gift. So let me um, start reading the word of God. And I will begin with the book of Mark. If you would like to follow me. And that is found in chapter 12, verses 41 and 44. Mark. Chapter 12, verses 41 to 44. And it says, And Jesus sat over against the treasury and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury, and many that were rich cast in much. And there came a certain poor widow, and she threw in two mites, which make a farthing. A farthing is a small coin with little value. And he called unto him his disciples and saith unto them, Verily I say unto you that this poor widow hath cast more in than all they which have cast into the treasury. For all they did cast in of their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all that she had even all her living. Let's go to the book of Luke, and that is chapter 21, verses 1 to 4. Let's see what Luke has to say. And he looked up and saw the rich man casting their gifts into the treasury. And he saw also a certain poor widow casting in thither two mites. And he said, Of a truth I say unto you, that this poor widow hath cast in more than they all. 
for all these have all of their abundance cast in unto the offerings of God. But she of her penury, which, is, which means poverty, hath cast in all the living that she had. May the Lord bless the reading, the hearing, and the doing of his word. I would like to invite anyone who can kneel with me for our congregational prayer. Please kneel with me. Thank you. Our loving and merciful Heavenly Father, you have brought us back to commune with you on this blessed Sabbath day. What a joy it is to worship you in truth and in spirit, for you are our living God and creator, the author and finisher of our faith. Kneeling before you in humility, please search our hearts for anything that needs to be confessed so we may ask for your forgiveness. Cleanse us and free us from whatever bondage we are in and deliver us to freedom only found in you. Please comfort the Vargas family over the passing of Julian Sr. Give them strength, peace, and hope. And I just learned also that Dina, who is a regular visitor here, her father passed away on Thursday night as well. So Lord, comfort Dina's family as well. I'm lifting up our church members with health and physical ailments, such as Donna, Mr. and Mrs. M, Sheila, and others, Lord, whom I may not be aware of this morning. Please provide your healing power. Also, minister to the needs of our members experiencing financial, marital, emotional, work, and spiritual issues and challenges. Lord, please be with them and Send the Holy Spirit to touch their hearts and to move them, Lord, towards you. And finally, please be with Pastor Martella as he delivers your message to us so you may be exalted, honored, and glorified. Amen. Send the Holy Spirit to open our hearts and minds to receive your message with gladness so we may leave this place renewed and changed into the likeness of Christ's character. Thank you for hearing my prayer and answering it according to your divine will as I ask all of these things in the loving and merciful name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen.
Thank you, Wilmer and Grace, for uh, short notice. The original supposed to be is uh, uh, Julian Vargas, but his dad passed away a couple of days ago at the age of 95. Uh, <laughs> Pastor Dad, no need of introduction for so many of us, but for the sake of our visitors, Pastor Dan pretty much grew up in this church the old church, it got burned down, uh, but this one is a new one. Um, his beautiful family is over there. The beautiful wife, Linda, and uh, the son, uh, Jeffrey, Eva. They have uh, four children. Their name is uh, Do Re Mi. Sounds like a music to me. Don't Do. Fa. Oh, Fa, the new one. <laughs> and you have another one, Noah. Do, re, mi, fa. No, it's not included. Different family. A different family. <laughs> yeah, Pastor Dan is a, uh, he loves God. He loves to serve. He served for a long time. He just recently uh, retired, uh, the pastor, but pastor never retired. Pastor is always pastor. He's uh, not even, uh, he just accepted a leadership position here, but he's already acting. He's uh, already attending uh, board meetings, uh, vespers, and uh, uh, midweek prayers, and so on. Uh, he loves to serve the Lord. Thank you very much. Such a blessing for our church that they came back here. Amen.
Good morning, everyone. Introductions can be scary places to go. You never know what they're going to say about you. I remember years ago, I moved to a new church, and the press, uh, the local newspaper, wanted to do an introduction, and they wrote it up. And um, they had me saying things that I never knew about before, <laughs> and things that probably weren't even true. But that's the kind of thing that happens. I'm grateful we can be together here today. There's a humorous story told about a church that was conducting its annual stewardship campaign. The pastor got up and made the appeal for every member to make their pledge. And as the congregation pondered their opportunity, one man jumped to his feet and raised his hand. He shouted, Pastor! I'm going to pledge $10. At that moment, a chunk of plaster from the ceiling came down and hit him on the side of the head. A little startled by the nudge from above, the man jumped to his feet once again and sputtered, I'll make it $1,000. To which the pastor said, hit him again, Lord. (laughs) It amazes me the things that churches will do to get people to give money, to give more money. Many years ago, I heard about a church that didn't have offering plates. They used a clothesline instead. And this is the way it would work. There would be a deacon on each end of the pew with the end of the clothesline, and they would move this thing over the heads of the people. And the idea was, since you can't put coins on a clothesline, only dollar bills, the church would get a bigger offering. Then there was Amy Simple McPherson, the Los Angeles evangelist, radio preacher, and founder of the Four Square Church. One Sunday morning, she stood before her congregation and made the offering appeal. She said, I want everyone who will give $100 to the church to stand to their feet. And on cue, she had the organist play the Star Spangled Banner. And then there was the whole system of indulgences generated way back when to create the funds to build St. Peter's Basilica. Churches do all kinds of things to get people to give. We guilt trip people, we manipulate people, we hold out incentives, you know, give $10,000 and we'll put your name on a brick. When really what God is looking for from us is honest gifts from the heart. In the Gospels, the story is told about real giving. It took place early one Sabbath morning in the courtyard of the temple. The place was alive with people. The the priests were in their rich robes. The teachers of the law had their scrolls tucked under their arms. The choir stood on the steps and quietly chanted. The people were all there eager for worship, all kinds of people. And into the scene stepped Jesus. He took his place and he began to look around to see what was going on. And the very first thing that he ever noticed was the fat cats coming in. I mean, they were dressed really nicely. They had a whole entourage of people with them hauling in carts filled with big bags of gold and silver. He saw them pull their carts up to the first offering box there along the wall and the next one and the next one and the next one until they had hit all 13 of those boxes. They would pull back the drawstring on the bag, hoist it up to the lip of the the funnel that went into the box, and then they just let her rip. I mean, zing, zing, bang, bang, clank, clank, it went as it whizzed around the funnel and finally hit the bottom. It was quite a show, and you would think that Jesus would be impressed. But you know how it is so often, the things we get so impressed with, Jesus doesn't get all that excited about. What really got Jesus excited this morning was the little quiet woman who slipped through the crowd and made her way to the offering box. She was a widow. She was all wrinkled up with old age. She was dirt poor. She was dressed in this thin little robe. In her hand, she had a tiny little person in it only two mites, the smallest coin of them all. It was all that she had, and she was eager to give it to God. 
She stood on tiptoe and, and dropped those two mites into the box and then quietly turned to, to make her exit when Jesus turned to his, his disciples and he said, hey guys, we need to talk. Did you see what that woman gave? She gave far more than all those rich boys rolled together. I mean, they only gave their pocket change while this woman gave everything she had. She did it with heart. That's what I call real giving. And the lady, she heard every word Jesus had to say, knowing there was someone who understood her heart and someone who appreciated her gift brought tears to her eyes. It's quite a story. Both Mark and Luke tell it. It's short, it's simple, and it has the power to inspire real giving today. So today I'd like to unpack five important lessons from the story of the widow and her two mites. Lesson number one, real giving is something Jesus sees. If you're writing it down, real giving is something Jesus sees. Mark tells us in his story that Jesus watched the crowds. And, and Luke tells us that he looked up. He saw the temple. He saw the boxes along the wall. He saw the rich guys coming in with their big bucks, ready to make a big display as they dropped their big offering in the big box. He heard the brass bands play to congratulate them, and the crowds clapped their hands. But then Jesus saw the little lady quietly slipped through the crowd and put her two cents in the box. What's more, he saw her heart. Now here we have to ask the question, what's the big deal? Does Jesus have an unhealthy preoccupation with money? No, he doesn't at all. What Jesus is interested in here is not so much our money, but what that money represents. You see, money is something that has value to us. We work 40, 50, 60, 80 hours a week for it. We take our paycheck and we put it all in the bank, both checking and, and savings. We invest it in stocks and bonds. We use it to pay off the monthly mortgage, to put food on the table, to clothe and educate our children. Our money and the things that we do with our money are powerful symbols and mediums of exchange. And when we take our time, our talents, and our treasures, and we give them to God, we in essence say, God, I love you. You are the most important thing to me. I'm going to trust you with my life. Real giving is a matter of heart. And Jesus sees that kind of thing. Lesson number two. Real giving requires faith. Real giving requires faith. I can just hear the chatter in this woman's head all the way to the temple. Your husband is dead, and you don't have any kids to take care of you. You're dirt poor. You have no pension, no social security, no annuities, no IRAs, no 401k. You got nothing. You have no food in the cupboards. And what's more, you need a new coat desperately before winter comes. All you've got are these two mites in your purse, and you better keep them because you're going to need them. And every single time the woman comes back with, well, I know that God can be trusted. I know that God is faithful. I know that God will take care of me. And so once again, this woman places herself in the hands of God. That is faith, real faith. Back in the days of the Great Depression, there was an Adventist lady who had Bible studies with one of her friends. They read the story of Jesus, and the woman fell in love with the Savior. They studied about the seventh-day Sabbath, and the woman embraced that. They studied about healthful living from the Bible, and the woman made some lifestyle changes that were very important. And then they studied about Christian stewardship, 
how both the tithes and the offerings belonged to God. And it was at this point that the Adventist lady got really nervous because she knew that her friend and her family were struggling through hard times. When the lesson was over, the woman went into the kitchen. She opened up her kitchen cupboard door, and she pulled out the jar that held her $5 grocery allowance. And from it, she took 50 cents. She said, you know, it costs 40 cents to get to church on the bus, and I'm not going to be able to make it. So here, take the 50 cents and take the tithe to church for me. Like the woman in the story, she decided to just trust God and see what would happen. Well, the next week, they got together for their Bible study, and the woman met her Adventist friend at the door, and she said, you know what? God has opened to me the windows of heaven. Right after you left last week, a dairy man showed up on my doorstep saying, could you use some skim milk? Evidently, the price of milk has dropped so low, it's not even worth selling. So every morning, he drops 10 quarts of skim milk on my doorstep, when he's on his way to town to sell cream to the butter factory. Next week, the two women got together for their next Bible study, and the woman met her at the door and said, you're not going to believe this. God is still opening the windows of heaven. There's a man down the street who has a great big apple orchard, and he he can't afford to hire anyone to come pick those apples, so he told me to come help myself. My basement is overflowing with apples. I've been making applesauce and apple butter and apple cider and apple fritters and apple cakes. I've been, I'm just, I have more apples than I know what to do with. The next week, they got together for their next Bible study. And the woman said to her Adventist friend, "Uh, God is opening the windows of heaven even wider. The other day, the bank president called, and I just knew he was going to foreclose on our house because we have not been able to keep up with the monthly payments. And the bank president said, Mrs. Jones, I understand your husband is a painter. We have been foreclosing on so many houses these days, and we cannot sell them until they're painted. Do you think your husband could paint the houses for us? We will pay him very well. When hard times hit, God's people just keep giving, knowing that God will come through every single time. Lesson number three. Real giving doesn't make excuses. Mark that down. Real giving does not make excuses. If ever there was a person who had a right to make an excuse not to give, it was this lady. You want to know why? Because the priests were thieves. They were taking money out of the offering boxes. They were padding their pockets. They were ripping off old ladies and laughing all the way to the bank. These guys were so crooked that they had to be screwed into the ground when they died, and everyone knew it. We live in times when people are raising serious questions about the church. They say the church is filled with hypocrites. They say that all the church ever wants to talk about is money. They say that church leaders can't be trusted. They say that the church mismanages the money. And do you know what the upshot of the whole thing is? They take the tithes and the offerings that rightfully belong to God and they keep them in their pockets. The lady in the story stands to remind us that faithfulness and the tithes and the offerings is more of an issue between you and God than it is between you and the church. Now, if you have some concerns about how that money is being managed, by all means, go and have the conversation. Have that conversation with the pastor, with the church treasurer, with the finance committee, the treasurer of the conference, whoever it is that you need to speak with. And please, go with a humble heart, a heart that has been prepared by prayer, and say, this is the way it looks to me. Are there pieces of the picture I might be missing? Work it through together for the common good of the church. And always, through it all, Just keep giving. 
Don't make excuses. Lesson number four. Real giving is eager to see God's work advance. You see, this woman believed in God's work. She believed that the ministries of the temple were important. She believed that the ministries of the temple were essential to growing, strong, healthy believers. She believed that the ministries of the temple were an important part of God's plan to win the world. That God's mission was worthy of her support. And that tells me something here. It tells me that God is looking for that kind of thing in the church today. People who believe in the church. People who will invest in the ministry of the church. People who will help to move the whole thing forward. It has been said that the church is a lot like a bicycle. It's either going to go forward or it's going to fall over. And when we give, everything moves forward. Boys and girls are introduced to Jesus Christ and discipled by the Sabbath school, the adventurers, the pathfinders, the church school. Our sparkling, clean, and well-maintained facilities provide a safe and attractive place for us to bring our family and friends to meet Jesus. Our personal evangelism efforts are leveraged by by engaging health ministries and community gardens and literature distribution programs and, and evangelistic meetings. The mission of the church of the round, around the world just keeps many more and more people to Jesus Christ. Real giving is eager to see God's work move forward. Lesson number five. Real giving is often sacrificial. This woman gave her last two mites. This woman gave absolutely everything she had, and she did it willingly. She did it cheerfully. She did it from her heart. Many years ago, the the Butterball Turkey Company opened up a hotline with the idea that they would help people with their holiday cooking. And one day, a woman called up the hotline, and she says, Hello, my name is Janet. And I've had this turkey sitting on the bottom of my deep freeze for the last 23 years. What I want to know is, is it okay to eat? And the lady said, Janet, I'm happy to tell you that your turkey is perfectly safe to eat. There's just one thing. It won't taste very good. (laughs) Oh, well, Janet said, I guess I'll just give it to the church then. When we give, God is not looking for the leftovers. He is looking for gifts that are given from the heart, gifts that are often sacrificial. That is absolutely one of the the clearest lessons in the whole story of the widow and her two mites. You see, the wealthy snobs that traipsed through the temple only gave their pocket change, while this woman gave everything she had. There was nothing left. There was nothing left to buy an old coat at the flea market so she could get through the winter. Nothing left to buy a crust of bread to quiet the growling in her stomach. Nothing left for that once-in-a-lifetime Mediterranean cruise. Nothing. She gave everything she had to God. She gave sacrificially. Byward Parks tells the story of the time when he was invited to preach for the dedication service of a brand new Seventh-day Adventist church in Romania. Hundreds and hundreds of people showed up. Everyone was so excited that they could finally have a church home of their own. There were women with their scarves around their heads that laid mountains of flowers on the steps. The choirs sang beautiful anthems of of praise and thanksgiving to God. The poets recited lines written especially for this occasion. Community leaders and church leaders each got up and made speeches. It was a wonderful time of praise and fellowship. At one point, Bayard says that his interpreter leaned in close and whispered, you see that man over there with the worn tweed cap clasped tightly in his hand? 
He has given the last four years of his life to build this church. He has given everything he has to help build this church. Then he lowered his voice and said, look at his feet. He has given so much to the church that he had to borrow shoes from his neighbor just to come to church today. Sacrificial giving is something I struggle with. Maybe you do too. I struggle with it because I'm a selfish pig. I just want to keep it all for myself. But the other challenging piece in all of this is how do you define sacrificial giving? Where do you, you draw the line between you know this and that? I, I've struggled with that. And here's what I've come to. Sacrificial giving brings to me the opportunity to give up something for myself because what I want for God is far more important. Let me say that again. Sacrificial giving brings to me the opportunity to give up something for myself because what I want for God is far more important. 20-some years ago, I was invited to become the pastor of a brand-new church plant just north of Boston. Wonderful church, wonderful place to live. Uh, we had first-generation immigrants in our church from Africa and Europe and the Caribbean and Central America and South America, the islands of the Pacific, the Far East. We even had a Filipino or two in our church. Wonderful people, but they didn't have much money, and the cost of living was high, and, and we didn't have a church of our own. We wanted a church of our own where we could worship God and do evangelism and have fellowship together. And finally, the, came, the time came for us to, to prepare for that opportunity. We had a capital campaign, and we asked everyone to go home, get on their knees, and ask God what kind of miracle he wanted to work through them? Well, since I asked my members to do that, I had to do it myself. So I went home, I got down on my knees, and I said, God, where do you want me to make some sacrifices? What can I do? Because I don't know the way to go on this. And then God impressed on my heart this. He said, you know, that new tech toy you've been saving up for all these months, take the money right now and put it in the building fund. So I did. And you know what happened? I not only had an opportunity to provide for the, the building of a new church home, I had that brand new tech toy in my hands just a couple months later. Somehow the money showed up for it. Then I got another idea. Every year, my mom and dad send me a birthday card with a check in it. And I decided, well, maybe I should ask them to not write me a check this year, but to write a check for the building fund. So I wrote them a letter, told them my thoughts, and a couple weeks later, a, a card showed up with a check for 10 times what they normally give me for a birthday. Now normally I would take that money and buy myself a sweater, but I'll tell you, that experience warned me far better than any sweater would have done. Real giving often requires sacrifice. It puts God first. And every single time, God gets the last word on things. And we are blessed, so very blessed. Well, the story ends on a very amazing note. Jesus looks at all the rich guys and their perfunctory offering. He looks at the, the little lady and her gift of two mites. And he says to his disciples, that is the better gift. That is the bigger gift. And indeed it has been because down through the years, it has inspired generations of giving that have provided for the building of churches and schools and universities and hospitals and publishing houses and health food factories and all the rest. It has taught boys and girls about Jesus. It has resourced creative ministries to reach the families and the communities around us. 
It has carried the good news of the gospel to the people of the great cities of the world and remote jungle villages. Real giving makes a difference. And so today I want to ask you the question, do you want to make a difference? Do you want to become part of something bigger than yourself? Do you want to make a positive impact? Do you want to invest in eternity? Then give. Give. As you plan your year in giving, as you plan your giving for the coming year, please give with heart. Give with faith. Give without making excuses. Give sacrificially. And I promise you, our God above will see it all. And together, we will go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere, that Jesus Christ is born, that Jesus Christ is alive, that Jesus Christ is coming soon again. Amen. Let's all stand for our closing song.
treasures. May we honor you in every aspect of life and tell it on the mountain, the good news of Jesus. In his name we pray, amen.